So we are live. Thank you all for joining. This session will, of course, be recorded and you can access it also after the event. Again, thank you for joining. I want to thank also my legendary panelists. We have Larry Siegel, Rick Edelman, David Rose. Let me briefly introduce them. So Larry Siegel is the director of research at the CFA Institute Research Foundation. Before that, he was director of research at the Ford Foundation. He recently wrote a book called Fewer, Richer, Greener, which is, of course, essential reading for what we are discussing today. Larry actually suggested to me to save the children and your in investments from apocalyptic thinking, and he will elaborate today why the bad news is mostly wrong. At the end of today's session, we will also discuss how we as investors can develop independent thinking and find our own fact-based position we will also examine how to build resilient portfolios which can capture the upside of technological growth and innovation. So please, please make sure to stay online with us for the entire session so you can benefit from these points as well. So David Rose is a serial entrepreneur. He's an angel investor and associate founder of Singularity University. David is a futurist and a venture capitalist. He founded New York Angels decades ago, right, and has personally invested in over 100 early stage companies with exits to Facebook, Google, Intel, and other industry leaders. We also have Rick Edelman, who is the founder of Edelman Financial Engines, a company he started over 35 years ago. He is a member of the Financial Advisor Hall of Fame and has been ranked three times as the number one independent financial advisor by Barron's. So a few technical things. Should you lose the connection today, just hit refresh in the browser and uh, reload the session again. People also ask usually, do we share the presentation? Tomorrow you will get an email from me which will include the replay links and we will attach um, Larry's presentation. So lastly, before we start, I have the pleasure to read this really important disclaimer, right? Because as you know, this webinar is intended to be of general interest only and should not be construed as investment, legal, tax or accounting advice or a recommendation or solicitation to buy, hold or sell any security or adopt any investment strategy. So going into our theme today, and let me start with Rick, let me start with you and clarify for our listeners, right, that we are in no way wanting to downplay the challenges we're facing today, right? So actually we are experiencing horrible problems, climate change and its disastrous effects. There's increased violence and displays of racial bias. We see growing income inequality, record-setting drug addiction and death, the biggest ever federal deficit and national debt, fears of raising inflation, raising inflation, interest rates, tax rates. We have threats from Russia, North Korea and others. We have the Taliban taking over Afghanistan again. We see cybersecurity failures and ransomware demands and of course over the last one and a half years, COVID-19, which, as we have seen, isn't over yet. So, Rick, given all of this, is there any hope? Over to you. Uh, Matthias, thank you so much for having me here, and great to be on this illustrious panel uh, with uh, David and, and Larry. Um, well, I'm ready to have a drink. Uh, I mean, based on, <laughs> based on what you just said, yes, it is a pretty dire set of circumstances that we are finding ourselves in, and it's really, really easy to be very depressed and pessimistic about our current state of affairs nationally and globally as well as the future. Uh, it is really easy to be very dejected and to frankly catastrophize, basically think that everything is going to get so bad it's going to be the end of the human race as we know it and the destruction of the planet. Uh, if the facts that you just cited, and all of those are facts, they are indisputable, everything you just named is indeed occurring right now. We have some very serious challenges that we are facing as a society nationally and globally. If those facts were the only facts, then yeah, I'd be drinking right now. Um, the good news is that those facts are only part of the facts. 
it is a two-sided coin. And if we were to take a look at the other side, we would discover that while we are facing incredible challenges, we have to acknowledge two very important facts. Number one, the challenges that we are facing today are not the worst that our society has ever faced. They may be the worst that we have individually faced, perhaps in our lifetimes or in our circumstances, but they are not the most severe challenges that our world has ever encountered. When we go back to the bubonic plague, when we go back to the world wars, when we look at the challenges over the course of human history, what's going on right now, frankly, can be regarded as a bit of a cakewalk. Number two, we have more tools, more ability, more potential to overcome these challenges than anyone ever had in the course of the human race. And that is what makes this such a terribly exciting opportunity, unprecedented in its scale and scope. And we're going to talk about all of those elements and why we collectively on this program believe that the future is going to be bright, that the best is yet to come, and most importantly, those who prepare themselves accordingly are going to be the ones that not only survive but thrive and prosper for themselves, their families, and our surrounding communities. So let's not uh, open that liquor bottle just yet until we're ready to cork a champagne toast, because I think by the end of this conversation, we're going to agree that, yeah, in the face of all these challenges, we are positioned to overcome them very well. Right. So, thank you so much. Um, should we... Let me just exit this. Um, Larry or David, right? Who, who wants to go next? Larry, are you ready? You have prepared a couple of slides. Yes, I, I just wanted to reflect first on what Rick said. Yeah. Which is, this is really a terrible time to uh, give an optimistic talk about the future. But just look where we've come from in the last 250 years, from a society where two or three percent of the people in the world live decent lives by our own standards. Still, if, even if they were relatively rich, if, if you got sick, you couldn't take a shot of penicillin. Uh, Nathan Meyer Rothschild, uh, or Rothschild, the richest man in the world at the time, worth about a quarter of a trillion dollars in today's money, had died at the age of 58 because he got an infection that would have been cured with one dose of penicillin if, if he had lived 100 years later. I, I'm going to share the screen, uh, if, if I can figure out how, and uh, go through a few slides. Video file, I don't have a video file. Oh, thank you. So I'm going to make this big. And there are lots of slides here, but I'm just going to breeze through most of them uh, in the interest of time. Uh, the population explosion, uh, which was the, uh, the climate change panic of a generation ago, we, we were at the top of this hockey stick here. But it's, so it's basically over. Uh, let's draw this on a log scale. Uh, we're, we're about here. And uh, the world of three billion people that I grew up in you know, when I was a kid, it is long gone. Uh, we're not going to get back there. I don't want to get back there. But uh, we're not going to continue to be on, a, on the path that we saw in the, in the hockey stick. Um, the world population is going to peak around 10 billion uh, late in this century and then begin to decline. And there's a countercurrent here, which is that recently I've heard people say, oh my God, we're going to run out of people. Nobody's having any kids. Yeah, I, there is something to that, and it's a concern that people don't want to have kids. But I look at it this way. The population explosion is a real problem, and the market solved it. Which market? The market for children. Parents have decided all over the world, you know, China, Iran, Brazil, Mexico, not just the first world, that uh, it's a better investment to have fewer children and put more resources into them. So that the, the population explosion is a problem that we faced at one time, and we can 
now set aside, as you see, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, but not Southern Africa, uh, is the only part of the world where the population is growing fast. So we're looking at a world which will have more Africans, um, but a, a much richer Africa, and uh, that, will, that will be a good thing, because Africa deserves its place in the sun. The total fertility rates have converged toward the, the first world level, and in, even in sub-Saharan Africa, we see a, a major decline. It's not as fast as Asia uh, was in the 70s and 80s, but, but Asia had China, which had a one-child policy, which was probably a mistake. So we can't expect that out of sub-Saharan Africa. This population uh, decline, or fertility decline is about what you expect in a rapidly developing part of the world, which, thank goodness, Africa is now one of those. Now, the world has also gotten so much richer in the last 250 years that if we continue on the path that we've been on, and Rick went over some of the reasons why it's going to be a bumpy ride, and that, you, know, you could have a depression, you could have another depression, you could have what we had recently, which is, a, it's not on this chart, a, a micro depression caused by a pandemic. But this is one and a half to 2% growth every year, so that uh, the, the number is higher for the rest of the world than it is for the United States. Uh, amazingly, the world now has an average income of about $18,000 a year, about what the United States was in 1946, when we were indisputably a first world country. And, and now uh, the whole world is living at a standard, on average, that is comparable to that. So we've gone from poor and sick, these are life expectancies on the y-axis, incomes in the log scale on the x-axis to rich and healthy even india that's the big red bubble to the left of the big china red bubble uh, it has a higher income and a much higher life expectancy than the richest country in the world did in 1800 that was the netherlands although the u.s caught up with it and surpassed it soon after that so are we looking at the kind of problems that Rick identified in, in our own recent past? No, the number of people dying due to famine has collapsed to almost zero. And even in my own parents' uh, generation, we not only had two world wars and a depression, but famines, not, not in the United States, but somewhere, uh, that were 10 to 100 times as severe as anything that we've seen in the last couple of decades, that's progress. We, the, the most important thing you need to do is eat. And people are eating, including in countries where they weren't eating a, a couple of generations ago. Life expectancy has soared. In, even in Ethiopia, which we sometimes think of as the poster child for deprivation, the life expectancy is now 65. When was life expectancy 65 in the United States? about 1932. So the, the world is converging on a very respectable standard of living uh, on average. Again, there are exceptions. We need to uh, be aware of the exceptions. Uh, greener, I'm going to address later. If we get to it, I, I should stop and say, well, why did I do all this work? Why, why did I write a 400-page book on, on these issues? I'm hearing parents say that their kids come home from school, minor, much older, but they're, they're telling their parents, why did you bother having me when the world is going to be a rotating cinder in 12 years or 35 years or some small number, which is within their, their lifetime, and uh, when the population is going to be so large, we won't have anything to eat, and we won't even have a place to stand. Well, none of it is true. The, the climate change is a challenge, but at current rates of both climate change and remediation that we are uh, 
capable of doing, uh, some people are going to have to move. And in the past, when the climate changed, say in Central Europe and the uh, early modern era, uh, they all came here. And that, that was um, climate change induced migration. And my own ancestors came a little later. Uh, but but the, the big migration across the Atlantic across Northern Europe uh, was entering a Little Ice Age. Now, now it's out of the Little Ice Age, it's a warm period, and uh, not very many Europeans are coming here. But, but people are coming from the hot regions of the world, instead of being too cold, it's too hot. This has been going on for the entire uh, length that the human race has existed, except now we have weather satellites, we have airplanes, we have international relief. Uh, the number of people who are going to have to move uphill is around 200 million uh, who live in the deltas of the Mekong River, the Andes, and so forth. That many people move internationally every year. So we can do this. Why don't we uh, uh, open this up to either uh, David's presentation or a conversation, depending on what uh, Matthias wants to do. Yeah, so uh, David, you, you chime in as the futurist. So what, what do you see? What is your take on all of this? So, so listening to Rick and the historical perspective, and Larry and how things immediately right now are within our control and we're actually improving it. Let me take the other perspective, which is the longer term one, right? So what is Singularity University? What is this whole singularity futuristic thing anyway? Back 45 years ago, 1975, Gordon Moore, who was the CEO of Intel, noted a very interesting observation. He noted that the number of transistor equivalents that Intel could fit onto a single integrated circuit had been doubling every two years. And as far as he could see, looking into the future in, in Intel's labs, he said, um, for the foreseeable future back in 1975, um, that would be the same rate of increase, doubling every two years. Uh, and that was a pretty interesting observation, which has since become known as Moore's Law. And if you think about that, that doubling, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, all the way up, gets to some very, very big numbers. Um, and if you now look at that in terms of all the technology that's around us, all the things, the amazing things that have happened just in the lifetimes of all of us. I mean, the, the Queen of England made her first television broadcast to her subjects during my lifetime. Um, so the technology has obviously been skyrocketing. And a guy named Ray Kurzweil, who's one of the brightest guys around who many of us know, um, uh, noted Gordon Moore's law uh, about the doubling of, of technology uh, you know, every 18 months, every two years. And he said, well, technology in general is not just integrated circuits. How about if we could generalize that growth? And so instead of just integrated you know, transistors on a chip, how about if we generalize it so we can look at things in the past? Um, things like, you know, millions of instructions per second per dollar to try and get everything, you know, packed up into one thing. And he did that. And the result that he found when he looked at historical changes is that that rate of change that Gordon Moore had noted with chips in 1975 had actually been happening since the beginning of the century. When you started going from Herman Hollerith with punch cards and the founding of IBM for the 1910 census to uh, relays that allow you to um, switch a large load with a small effort to vacuum tubes, which allowed you to, to store a live bit of data um, to uh, solid state transistors um, and then to integrated circuits, each of these being a paradigm shift that changed the way growth could go after that. And so um, Kurzweil said, wow, if this rate of technological change has actually been steady since the beginning of the 20th century, it's been doubling you know, every two years, hmm, what if you look back before the, the 20th century, back to the Industrial Revolution, back to the Iron Age? I mean, how far back did this go? And so he pulled together everybody's lists of all the major paradigm shifts and inventions and changes in history from the Smithsonian, the British Museum, and Will and Ariel Durant and everything else. And he charted every single example of technology, of humans using technology, whether it's fire or the Bronze Age or you know, the Artesian wells or the Roman aqueducts. And he charted all of those and he looked at it and son of a gun, it turns out that this rate of change has been constant since the beginning of recorded human history. So he said, wow, 
Well, what happens if you now apply that going forward? What happens if you consider that the rate of change of technology is not just linear the way we um, have been known to think about it, but exponential? And so when this, he, he wrote a book called The Singularity is Near, the singularity being the point at which computers and technological development reached the equivalent of human brain and human development. And he projected that the next change, the next major paradigm shift is gonna be when humans and computers somehow converge. Either you'll be able to clone a human in a box or you'll be able to have a, a, a box that thinks like a human. And he projected this, this stunning projection at 2045 which is less than 20 years, you know, 24 years from right now. Um, and so when this, he wrote a book called The Singularity is Near, and when the book came out, it was greeted by effectively three different schools of thought. One of those schools said, well, no, humans are exceptional. We have human exceptionalism. You know, computers can never do anything equal. Humans don't even, you know, that you're crazy. We're a God-given race. And then the second one of very smart people said, okay, um, yeah, it's accurate historically, and it may even be accurate in the future if we continue on this path, but given apocalyptic thinking, whether it's Malthusian population growth or all the things we've heard about climate crisis and everything else, don't worry about this far theoretical future because we as humanity are not going to be able to survive. And that's the, the apocalyptic way of thinking. But there was a third take. And that third take is represented by Rick and Larry and me and, and Matthias, um, is that as a human race, all of us together, we are actually, you know, 50.1% able to stay ahead of that cataclysmic apocalyptic era. And so therefore we will be able to leverage all of this advancing technology for our benefit. And on the basis of that, um, the, all these people who were thinking about the positive side of the future got together and created Singularity University, of which uh, I'm an associate founder and I founded Singularity Use Finance, Entrepreneurship and Economics Trend. So just to be clear, I'm speaking today from my own perspective, David S. Rose, myself, this is not an official Singularity U pronouncement, but that's the background to what we were doing. Because as Ray noted, once you think about exponential growth, the entire discussion changes, right? What does that mean? Well, if you take a look over here, um, linear growth, which is what we all think about, one, two, three, four, you go out, you know, 13 steps and you get from one to 13. One, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, 12, 13, because you're going up, out one and up one at the same time. But if you look at exponential growth, where you're doubling with every step, in 13 steps, <laughs> instead of being at 13, you're at a billion, one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so therefore, what Singularity U teaches and what we've been discussing for over a decade now at Singularity U, and Rick has gone through the program, and Rick has written an amazing book, by the way, um, about how you can take this exponential futuristic thinking and apply it to your actual current real-time real investments. Because once you take a look at that curve over here, right, and you look at the exponential growth line compared to the linear growth line, what that means is that in two years, technology will be twice as far as it is today. And in four years, it'll, it'll be twice as far as that, four, and then eight and 16. And with all of that kind of technology, those are the tools that Rick was talking about that humanity now has for the first time ever. And those kinds of tools will enable us to get past the crises, which are real. Climate crisis is absolutely positively real. And we've got some political things that are going on and that are, that are challenging. And, and as the pandemic has shown us, we are not immune to the pandemics of the past, like the Spanish flu and everything else, and the bubonic plague. But we now have the tools because of this exponential technological growth to allow us to deal with this now and for the foreseeable future. Let me add something here that's really important. Uh, and David, that was a great description of exponentiality. But the, but exponentiality confuses a lot of folks because we're not used to thinking that way, as you noted. We're used to counting linearly. Uh, let me let me give you an example of this. If you if your goal was to go from here to there, and you were going to do it in 100 steps, 100 increments, if you were doing it linearly and you went from here to 50, you would be halfway done. And you would say to yourself, gosh, I've made a lot of progress, I'm halfway accomplished my goal, I've done half the work and I've made it halfway, and I need to work another half and get the other halfway. That's linear thinking. Exponential thinking is very different. If you're taking 100 steps exponentially, you'll go 99 steps and only be halfway done. It's the final step 
that provides the other 50%. When you think about it in that context, you begin to understand why, with all of the incredible innovations that are coming, many of which already here, and you're wondering, how come we're worried about climate change, we're never going to solve it, we're never going to fix it, we're exponentially addressing climate change. And it doesn't seem apparent because you're looking at it linearly. We haven't made much progress. I've made 50 steps already. How come we're not 50% done? But we're developing the resolutions and the innovations exponentially. And so it's kind of like being at the knee of the curve in an aggressive growth chart. And so exponential modification sneaks up on you. It's not apparent. You don't really notice that it's happening until it's upon you. And then it's suddenly shocking that all of a sudden the solution is in front of you. And you know, it's hard to remember that the uh, iPhone is only about 13 years old. It's hard for any of us to remember life without it. That's an example of exponentiality. We spent decades and decades of research to be able to get to the point of launching that incredibly innovative product, which is now such a fundamental part of our daily lives. So, uh, David, your, your explanation of it is, is absolutely right on. And I appreciate your mentioning my book, The Truth About Your Future, uh, which is uh, an explanation of artificial intelligence, robotics, a, uh, big data, 3D printing, nanotech, biotech, bioinformatics, fintech, edtech, agritech, uh, all of these innovations and how they represent incredible investment opportunities and how these technologies are going to radically allow us to solve the incredible problems that our world is facing. So not only are we going to make things better, we're going to get richer along the way by taking advantage of it. Uh, I launched the very first Exponential Technologies ETF with BlackRock back in 2015. Now there are dozens of these ETFs available from ARK Investments, State Street and Kensho, Global X, Invesco, uh, and others. And it just shows how there is now readily available opportunity for you to make investments in the 21st century instead of relying on the old school stuff of the 20th century. Well, let me comment briefly. Uh, it, what you're describing, and I think this is really addressed to David, is linked exponentials. And that's a very important concept because nothing grows exponentially forever. If you could double the amount of food in the world, every two years or even every 20 years, eventually uh, you'd have so much food that nobody would be able to eat it. Where would you put it? Uh, we had exponential growth in telecoms until recently. Now it's slowed down because something like 7 billion of the 7.8 billion people in the world have access to some kind of telecommunication. Doubles again, you know, what have you got? Nothing. But that this slowdown, which is called the, the flattening part of the logistic curve, is linked to an exponential growth phase that's beginning in something else. And the telecom revolution produced changes in technology that make that something else, whatever it is, possible. So if you go back in history, you see exponential growth in some aspect of technology or tools or something that's good for people, whatever it is. And as it flattens out, you see another exponential growth phase taking place somewhere else that's related to the progress that took place before. So I call this linked exponentials. I actually got the, the term from Larry Smarr, who's another uh, a futurist and, and a scientist in, in San Diego. But I'm, I'm writing about it right now. And I, I think that that's how you can understand that we can have this continuous progress because even though you can't double any quantity for very long without having to be more than the mass of the Earth, uh, you get continuous progress by jumping from the flattening phase of one exponential to the, the sweet spot. I, I, you have a term for it. I forget what it is on the next one. Right. And that, that point is really important to you me. Know, Richard Feynman said it, that there's plenty of room at the bottom. Uh, and it is the race to getting smaller, uh, which is the notion of, Gore, of Moore's Law when he was talking about packing so many incredible number of uh, uh, computer data transistors on a single microchip. Uh, and so you're absolutely right. We're, we're shrinking everything in size. I mean, look at, look at your simple phone that we all have. 
if you look at all the products that are in this device, everything from maps to flashlights to calculators to uh, video cameras to telephones, think of all the physical devices we used to have on our desk that accomplished all those things. It's now compacted in a tiny little device like this. Uh, and computers, of course, are now sitting on our wrist in the version of an of a, uh, iWatch. Um, so we have to recognize your point very importantly, Larry, that uh, we are, as we are growing exponentially, we are also shrinking exponentially at the same time. And that's what's allowing us to pull all this off. And there's a third element we didn't even mention yet. Not only are we making things faster and more powerful and smaller, we're also making them incredibly cheaper. We are demonetizing all of this. I used to have to buy all those products separately. They're all now simply embedded in the smartphone as free downloadable apps. Yeah, if you took all the stuff in a smartphone and priced it at 1980 prices, it'd be about 20, about $30 million. Now, if you took out the Cray supercomputer and your smartphone is more powerful than the earliest Cray, uh, you, you'd get that down to around $24,000. You'd have a stereo and a telephone and a calculator and so forth. Right. Right. Um, so, so, so it's important. So that iPhone that you're holding there, Rick, people don't necessarily realize that that iPhone, the chip, the bionic chip from Apple in that iPhone can do 11 trillion instructions per second. Just let that number sink in for a second. That the chip inside that iPhone that Rick's holding can do 11 trillion instructions per second. And that kind of technology is what's doubling now, you know, every 18 months to two years. And so Larry, of course, is absolutely right. So no one technology will grow forever. At some point, you hit atomic numbers and stuff. But this series of linked S curves all the way back, um, these paradigm shifts, as, as we refer to them, um, when you link one on one S curve on top of another, you end up with this consistent, absolutely dramatic exponential growth over time. Yeah, I, I, I heard a saying the other day, our, our technology is absolutely divine. Our institutions are middle age and we as human bodies, you know, we, we, we're still stone age, right? Because we are dominated by um, emotions. And let me make um, the switch now to, you know, you know to, to emotions and how they affect us, right? So one tagline we had that doomsday scenarios can cloud our thinking and misguide our investments. And um, I want to share just very briefly something that happened to me last year, right? So I was saving money for my two children and right at the bottom of the COVID um, crisis, I decided now let's make the investment. So I put a bunch of money, put it into some diversified ETFs for my daughter and for my son. Uh, two days later, it was it was a great timing, but two days later, you know, I read the news again. I got afraid the world is going to tumble. There are new variants. It's going to be much worse. And then I sold all of it, except that I made a mistake. I only sold my daughter's holdings, but my son's holdings I kept by mistake. So my son is now sitting on a 60% uh, return. And later on, I was trying to do good to my daughter again and bought stuff, but now she's only having a 6% return. So this is again, I would say a real classic example what emotion can do to us and um, pessimism can do to us. And this is also why we have all this uh, drastic imagery about uh, the atomic wars and the apocalypse, etc. when we announce these webinars. So I really want to ask the panelists here, right, how can we arm ourselves right, against getting overwhelmed, losing our rationality, um, misguiding our investments, um, how do we keep rational? You're, you're asking the key question here, Matthias, and, and you're absolutely right. We are creatures of emotion, not intellect. Uh, and that's, that's hardwired into us through uh, human evolution. Uh, I mean, you're, you're walking around uh, out in the savanna and you see the grasses ruffling over there. Well, is that a breeze or is it a lion? Um, so the fight or flight uh, is embedded, hardwired into us because 
if you gamble and it turns out to be the lion, well, you're not going to procreate. <laughs> so those who ran away are the ones who had children. Uh, and they became to realize, you know what, if you see something moving out there, don't hang around, take off and protect yourself. And so this uh, acknowledgement that the upside reward is not as significant as the downside risk is what motivates a lot of us to focus more on negatives than positives. We know this in, in the media, bad news sells newspapers. Now, nobody is, you're, you're never gonna see a headline that says, everything is fine today, don't bother reading this. Uh, they're always gonna give you the worst headline, the scariest news to get you to tune in, to get you to listen, to watch, to read, to click, because that's what generates an audience, which is what attracts advertisers, and that's what makes the world go round economically. So we need to recognize that we are all victims of this, and there's been a huge amount of research. Uh, Daniel Kahneman has won the Nobel in this uh, research. Uh, Tversky is, was his mentor. I've written a book on the subject. Many others have done this as well on the issue of behavioral finance. And as a financial planner, the firm I created with $270 billion in assets at Edelman Financial Engines, we, we've learned over the decades that our clients um, are victims of this. We all are. It's, there's no escape because of our psychological and physiological wiring of how our brains work. And the subject of behavioral finance says that there are emotional, psychological biases we're all victims of. Everything from catastrophizing that I mentioned, you know, the stock market's uh, down, it's therefore going to go to zero. Or, oh my goodness, it's raining, there will therefore be a flood. Uh, or, you know, it's getting hot and therefore it's going to be the temperature of the sun. Uh, those kinds of catastrophizing, pessimism bias uh, and anchoring bias. Uh, there are dozens of these psychological biases. So the number one thing we have to do, Matthias, is learn about these biases. Learn that this is our natural innate tendency as human beings. Once we understand that we are susceptible to this, now we can begin to realize that that A is true and B to begin to acknowledge it when we're feeling that way. But at the end of the day, there's nothing we can do about it. We are emotional creatures. We're going to react emotionally. We're going to react bigger at bad than we do at good. Memories of bad last longer than memories of good. And therefore, we need the assistance of others. We need the advisors, the professionals, the consultants and counselors who can guide us and help us, handhold us, error check our thinking and feelings. Should I really be selling? That's what you needed, Matthias, before you sold. Do I really need to do this? Is this the right thing at the right time? Am I doing it for the right reason? Having a sounding board of a financial advisor, an attorney, a physician, an accountant, uh, these are, are ways that we can help prevent us from making the mistakes we're about to make due to our emotional makeup. I, I think that's exactly on target. I mean, I mean that should be encapsulated uh, and and written large on everybody's first bank account, right? I mean, because what 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 Rick has has discussed is completely accurate. We have a natural human bias because of behavior to always look on the downside and protect ourselves from that lion in the savanna, right? What's interesting is that I'm the other end of the spectrum. I'm the eternal optimist, the futurist. So my 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 normal life is thinking about the positive side as opposed to the negative. And you know what? Neither of these worlds is the place to completely inhabit. Um, one way you get eaten by the lion, and the other way you sort of starve because you didn't, you know, catch the the, the appropriate food you, you could catch. And so I so Rick's suggestion to work with a financial professional and somebody who is who is not you, who is not as emotionally involved as you are, who can provide you with objective guidance and, and advice and suggestions in the lay of the land, that makes a whole lot of sense. Because if you take a look at the people who over the longest period of time have made the most and conserved the most and had the most to pass along. These are the people who have successfully managed to not be, you know, put all of their stuff into cash under the mattress where, you know, you lose to inflation, nor on the other hand, you know, be gamblers who go to Las Vegas or Atlantic City or, or you know, try and corner the silver market and, and, you know, make everything on one giant big risk. But instead, it's people who realize that there is a rational amount. You want to make sure you have a nest egg that will be there for the long term to take care of you and your family, putting it away for your kids, as Matthias was mentioning. Um, you want to be able to have that solid base so you know you have the ability to take some of what you're doing. And that's why alternative assets have exploded 
uh, in investing over the last several decades. Because if you take a look at the university endowments, things like the reason that Yale University under Dave, the late Dave Swenson, who just passed away, was one of the greatest you know, pickers of, of all time, did so well is because after taking the core of the endowment in things that were relatively safe and, and, and typical, he did a whole lot of the rest of it into alternative assets and venture and other new kinds of things. And that is what boosts the returns up across the thing. So I'd love to hear from, from Rick and Larry in terms of sort of things like portfolio allocation as to how a rational person these days should look at that. I'd be very careful to think that you can be David Swenson. Uh, he, he had a unique gift. I don't know quite how to describe it. Uh, but I know how to describe Warren Buffett to you. Yeah. First of all, uh, he uh, made 95% of his money after he turned 65. That That's because of exponential growth. Of course, 95, the other 5% is more than a billion dollars. So he was doing fine. But, but Warren Buffett had a, a view that when I am buying a stock, I'm actually buying the company, and he had enough money that could buy the company, then influence the return through either shareholder activism or running the company itself in, in some instances. So that, that's kind of the first alternative investment in modern times. You go back to the 16 and 17 hundreds, all, all investments were alternative because there was no functioning stock market or bond market to, to speak of. But if you think that you are, have the same skills as Warren Buffett or David Swenson or Jim Simons, so, fine, go for it, give it a try. You might, but but I would anchor my, my investments in a more traditional portfolio and, and be satisfied with a lower rate of return because it's very difficult to, to pick ventures, uh, to pick other alternatives such as buyouts. Um, I, I but let's, let's, away from let's make sure we're clear, Larry, what you're saying. When you say you're willing to accept lower rates of return, you're referring to earning six, seven, eight, nine percent uh, as opposed to 20 or 30 percent. You're not talking well, that's about, right. You're yeah. not talking about one or two percent. But one or two percent is what you get in the bond market. And, and but we're in a particular I mean, it's called financial repression by economists. When when the monetary authorities drive interest rates down to the point where the real return on your investment, on your safe investments is negative, uh, it, you probably shouldn't hold them except for a small amount, uh, just as a, a kind of an anchor to windward in case everything goes to hell in a handbasket. Uh, six, seven, eight, nine is going to be hard to achieve from today's high levels of valuation. I can, I can kind of get to six. I think nine is out of the question unless we have an unprecedented boom in the world economy starting from here. And I think, therefore, uh, I'm going to uh, elaborate on your comment about uh, Warren Buffett. Warren is famous for a lot of uh, sayings and quotes. One of my favorites of his is that it's better to be approximately right than precisely wrong. Uh, right. And I think to to that point, your comment that Warren Buffett was you know able to achieve out, outsized returns because he was able to buy an entire company and influence its management, which ordinary investors have no opportunity to do. Okay. So while I might not be able to do what Warren did exactly, I can do what Warren did approximately through the advent of exchange traded funds and mutual funds. Yeah. I can invest thematically in the direction of specific industries, not necessarily isolated companies. I don't have to choose the next uh, winner in computers, but I can invest in the computing industry. I don't have to pick the next winning airline, but I can invest in the airline industry. Let's remember, of course, back in 1920, there were more, two, more than 200 automobile manufacturers in the United States. Today, there are three. So I don't have to worry about picking the right car company. I just got to invest in that sector. You know, if I were coming out of World War II as an aviator and I wanted to go work for the biggest, best commercial airlines, I would have picked Eastern and Pan Am. Yeah. Neither one of them are around anymore. PWA. Which is bigger than anywhere. Anyway, right. so uh, thematically is where it's at. And that's why my view, and I think this is where David is coming from, is that, yes, to your point, invest the bulk of the money safely, securely in a typically diversified portfolio, traditional stocks, bonds, and government securities, et cetera, and real estate and so on. But 
take a portion of your portfolio and allocate that to exponential technologies because that's where the exponential growth is going to occur. That's how you're going to create the wealth you're going to need to allow you to survive and thrive for as long as your life expectancy is likely to provide to you. And that means investing in companies involved that are developing the technologies and equally deploying them in their businesses. You don't just have to buy Apple and Amazon and Google and you know the, the FANG stocks. Don't just invest in the companies building the tech, invest in companies deploying it. For example, Domino's Pizza. This is you know, a company manufacturing the least technological product on the planet, a pizza. But more than half of their sales are being ordered by a smartphone. You, know, you can order a Domino's Pizza and they will tell you on the app the progress of it in the oven being made, being delivered at your doorstep with contactless delivery this is technological innovation. Amazon has hundreds of thousands of robots in their warehouses. So we want to take advantage of this opportunity. And that means investing in companies that are developing this. That's why David's focus as an angel investor, early stage is a very exciting approach for those who have the ability to get in on that. Yeah. Who's selling the robots? That's what I want to know. Say that again. Who's selling Amazon all those robots? Well, that's exactly my point. You want to invest in the robotics companies. You want to invest yeah. in Boston Dynamics. And you want to invest in the companies yeah. that are building the technology as well as the companies deploying it. Um, that's the focus of the ETF I invented at BlackRock, for example. And so what we have to recognize is that I believe you should have 20% of your portfolio in exponential technologies. And one of the most innovative is blockchain and digital assets. We are reinventing money. Uh, as we proceed and the innovations that are occurring in this space uh, are revolutionary. So we need to, instead of turning our eye on it and dismissing it as a fad or a fraud or it's too complicated, I don't understand it, it's just for my kids and grandkids, we need to get our arms around this, recognize this is the future that we're going to be living in and learn how it works to figure out the investment opportunities that are available to you. Okay, I, I got to jump in because I have got that. That's the, the perfect segue. That's the perfect segue, Rick. Um, so, I, as as you pointed out, I'm an early stage angel investor. I invest in early stage companies. I'm an entrepreneur, so I founded a whole bunch of companies. Um, and so, I happen to be the founder and CEO of the U.S. real estate market, which is my current venture, which is which is revolutionizing, hopefully, um, the way that institutions can invest in commercial real estate on a, on a fractional basis. But also, as a venture investor, I've got an investment into a venture fund, which I'm a founder partner from True Global Ventures 4, um, which invests only in blockchain and things and, and NFT. And one of the investments in that portfolio is a company called Sandbox, which sells NFTs. It's one of the leading players and marketplaces for NFTs. And some of the NFTs they're selling there, for those in the audience, NFTs stand for non-fungible tokens, which effectively are digital assets that are specific, unique things that you can buy. And they have they, they one of the biggest cat categories of sort of in-game in applications and NFTs are, are real estate, are land in these virtual games. And they have just raised around at an extraordinarily high number. And the amount of money that is literally in deca millions of dollars that is trading hands in this trading of virtual real estate is more than we're trading in the real world, existing world of real estate at the other end. So it is a, a absolutely, you know, all this new stuff is new stuff and a lot of new things will fail. As you pointed out, there were, you know, 200 uh, car manufacturers and now there are only three. But if you invest in the area, this is without question going to be a major, major growth area. Because, again, the whole question of blockchain and distributed ledger technology is one of the fundamental next paradigm changes in our generation. So um, what, what did we talk about today, right? So first we started with discussing innovation and exponential growth. Then we went into how to um, master emotions, how to make sure we're not falling for these biases uh, that Rick explained to us. There is another category I just wanted to mention briefly, which is um, sometimes we're just missing information. Larry, um, you have this chart about uh, the world getting greener. Um, maybe you can pull that up and we show that just as an example of things that we don't even know that are happening because we're not looking for that information or the media isn't telling us. Um, so, uh, Rich, what's the... Now we're making big. Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, see it now? 
now let me see you have to start the screen share again yep okay here okay. we go so yeah. you can see my slides yeah go to okay. green the yeah. whole world is not getting greener all at once uh, we're making progress bit by bit and uh, this is pittsburgh in 1940. Uh, i sent a photographer to the same corner for my book to just take a phone snapshot of that corner there it is uh, you can see all the way to the end of the street two or three miles away some of the old buildings are beautifully preserved there they've actually been washed so that uh, this the building that says loftus is the one that you're looking at on the left that has a historical appearance uh, in india i would expect the uh, air pollution to have gone the other direction they are now reaching the point where things are beginning to get cleaner because there's the political will and the financial ability to do that um, there's something called an environmental kuznets curve named after simon kuznets who discovered it um, the uh, sulfur dioxide in the air in london reached a peak in about 1850 smoke around 1895 has since come down actually in the 1950s there's a very serious smoke problem where the uh, smog was so bad that people walked into the, some one person at least walked into the thames and drowned because he couldn't see the to the bottom of his feet that that he was stepping off the ground into a river uh, that is no longer an issue uh, and the world is getting greener because of reforestation. Here's a map of Europe. It's a, a live animation of increased forests as farmland takes less and less uh, land area to grow more and more food. Uh, so the forests are growing back, or people are growing them back to harvest timber. It's playing as a loop. So it starts yeah. in 1900 and goes to great. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. I just wanted to bring oh, there's, this there's into. Virtual, there's my book. <laughs> Pardon? It's yeah. I, if you want to read all about it, there's my book. <laughs> uh, yeah, essential reading. So again, look, there's also information that, that we don't see, that we don't know, but it depicts a different story and, and we have to be aware of that as well. Right. Um, so David mentioned that he was alive when the Queen was doing her first live TV broadcast. Um, so I, I, I remember um, just look at these catastrophes, right, where some were thinking or projected the world would collapse. You remember year 2K? Right, that was one of those. Right, um, we had the you know Falkland Wars, we had the Iran Iraq War, we had Tiananmen Square, we had Hong Kong hang over to the um, to the UK, we had the Asia currency crisis '97, Russian bond default, we had LTCM, we had the stock market crash of 2001, we had 9/11, we had the financial meltdown of 2008, we had COVID, the dollar has not collapsed. The euro has not collapsed, right? Despite the Greek crisis, uh, the US did not fall into a recession. China did not fall into a recession and all of that. I mean, it's, 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 it's crazy. Every time uh, going back, right? You would have thought that the end is near. But as Howard Marx said, um, you know, the world <laughs> rarely ends. And, and let me add Sorry. to that, uh, Matthias, that yeah. You know, there are some folks who are watching this right now, and they are um, unpersuaded uh, because although we're painting a positive uh, scenario, they remain steadfast in their viewpoint that the problems of today are massive and potentially insurmountable, and that the world is simply going to come to an end. Life as we know it will be gone, and it's going to be. Uh, a, an apocalypse or a Mel Gibson scenario of a doomsday. My only response to that is the following. I'm not going to try to persuade you that you're wrong. I'm not going to try to convince you that that is not what our future is going to be. I'm simply going to say you shouldn't invest in a portfolio accordingly. If that happens, you know, my attitude is you might as well invest as though the world is going to survive and thrive. You might as well invest as though it's all going to work out. Because if it does go in the direction you're saying, it won't make any difference what you do. So you might as well just anticipate that it's going to go well. I mean, I, I'll just tell you how silly it is. I, I've had a client say to me, 
I'm scared to death about the stock market. I'm terribly worried about real estate and the, the, the government's debt and deficit and tax rates and inflations. All this is terrible. I'm selling all my investments and I'm like putting my money in the bank. I'm like, well, what makes you think the bank is going to survive? What makes you think you're going to be able to go to the bank and access your cash? And even if you can access your cash, how much do you think a loaf of bread is going to cost? And even if you're assuming you can abide the loaf of bread because the factory is going to be closed, the trucks aren't going to be able to deliver the bread to the store. You saw what happened with, with uh, toilet paper not being available when COVID started. So even if that worst case scenario does occur, I'll tell you, if you really do believe that way, what you really need to do, and I have a chapter on this in one of my books called What to Do in the Event of Economic Collapse, what you need to do is quit your job because your paycheck's worthless. You need to sell your house and buy a property up in the mountains, 100 miles away from any government uh, facility. You're a good water source. You need to get a good ATM, a couple of dogs, German shepherds, male and female, and load up on guns, bullets, and whiskey because whiskey is going to be the common currency that will be used to buy goods and services in the future. And if you're not willing to do all that, then quit kidding yourself about your doom stay scenario and stay invested, even though you don't want to. That, there you go. I mean, that, that, that actually is it, right? If the apocalypse is coming, and in this exponential world, we are unquestionably living in an exponential world. So if the apocalypse is coming, it's coming really soon. It's going to be here in a year or two or three or four. And Rick is absolutely right. You know, go be a survivalist and hang out in your bunker and sell everything. But if you believe, as do I, as does Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamandis and, and you know, everybody who, is, who is understands this exponential growth, that we are, you know, 51% good, that we will manage to get through this using the tools we have at our disposal. And then once you get your mindset, if, the, if there's one thing that can come out of today's webinar, um, it's that A, the world's not going to end, and B, we are this concept of exponential thinking. Um, and so, so, you know, Larry and, and Rick have both written great books on the subject. Um, Rick's in, in particular is all about actually investing given this kind of future. And so, and it's a wonderful primer, by the way, to the whole question of exponential growth and, and singularity. So I, I suggest everybody run out and get books by both of my co-panelists over here. Right. I think it's 75%, not 50.1. We take three steps forward and one step back. That's about the right pace for describing human history. Otherwise, we wouldn't have gotten here. 50.1 just isn't enough to explain the average income in the world being $18,000 American dollars a year. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that that number was, was, was 600. Right. That was 200, so, 250 years. Beethoven was working in Vienna on the symphonies, and yet, and obviously, there were some rich people in it. But, but that was the standard of living for the average human being in the world. And it, it wasn't that long ago, within my grandparents' lifetime, that you couldn't call your mother unless she was in the next room. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, do you so, remember the days of waiting until after 6 p.m. so that the phone call was cheaper? Oh, yeah, 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 calling yeah. somebody and hanging up so they could call back on, on, a, on a different reverse charge. Or right. the, the, the prices of international calls. I mean, I, I had my aunt um, move to the U.S. here from Germany in the 1950s, uh, uh, 60s. It was incredible. Um, you know, um, Rick, that, I, I loved your point about you know how, how should you invest, right? And I think this is really, I would say, the the final lesson. I, I want to pack into um, this webinar today. Um, let me also share here you know, something personal. In 1887, my great-grandfather was 25 years and he founded a shoe factory. Um, it was a huge success. By 1911, he was exporting shoes to Buenos Aires, to New Zealand, to Turkey, um, to the US, of course, all over the place. Um, he survived World War I, he survived the Weimar inflation, he survived um, World War II, and he was always a big believer in the stock markets and, of course, his own business, and everything of that uh, survived. So this is what we're talking about. We're talking about um, real assets. We are talking about uh, invest, stay invested, um, be smart. Um, don't succumb to your biases. Um, as Rick said, uh, find some bodies uh, to, as a sounding board before you do any stupid stuff. Um, we are now 
about to close this webinar after exactly one hour. Um, but before I hit end broadcast, are there any other final comments uh, from your side? I really want to thank everyone. This was a uh, incredibly insightful discussion that I am happy to broadcast on other channels. Any other final comments before we end? Just want to say uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. And uh, my book is called The Truth About Your Future. We'll get that, <laughs> right? Thank you for the opportunity to be here. My book is called Fewer, Richer, Greener. And David, we didn't talk about your books. No, right? I've, got a couple, I, I've got a couple of books. Um, my, my one coming up next year is about investing actually in real estate, and the others have been, uh, if you're actually interested as an angel investor in investing in this exponential stuff early on, uh, check out Angel Investing, the Gus Guide to Making Money and Having Fun Investing in Startups. Right. Cool. Okay, good. So thank you so much. Thank you for thank your time. You. Thank you everyone for chiming in. All the best and I'll hope to see you soon in the real life again um, this year or next year. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye all.